if you were to go to cognitive behavioral therapy, right, cognitive behavioral therapy, it's called CBT, it's based on this works of uh, this guy named Aaron Beck and a few other psychologists that pioneered what actually has to take place to help someone psychologically, emotionally, all that good stuff. And the idea behind cognitive behavioral therapy is, is kind of the it's kind of the antithesis of behaviorism, right? So there's a section in your in, in psychology, and it's certainly in your book that talks about like the limits to behaviorism. So if we look at how Skinner trains pigeons, superstitious behavior being reinforced. If we look at how Watson trains baby Albert, similar to how pa Pavlov trained the dogs to salivate. The idea behind behaviorism, it's not as if it's false, right? This is kind of important to understand. Behaviorism is not necessarily that it's wrong. Skinner, Watson, Pavlov, you know, Thorndike, all of these behaviorists were correct. You can train behaviors into animals and certainly into people. But the downside to behaviorism for solving psychological problems is pretty simple. It does not take into account motivation, emotional responses, psychological responses, your feelings or outlooks, your goals, right? Your fears, your concerns, your stressors. Behaviorism is really pretty limited when it comes to a complex issue. Most psychological issues are complex. They're usually very complex, right? So you get this whole biopsychosocial approach, right? For instance, every time something horrible happens, you, you see people on Twitter and you see people on Facebook and you see them online and there's, they, everybody, everybody has a a single cause sticker that they want to put on things. Well, that kid wasn't raised right. That person's a sociopath, right? That person is pure evil. And all these psychological problems that are super complex, people put really, 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 really simple causes on, right? Suicidal ideation, depression, anxiety, right? It's easy for people to say things like, well, this generation is more anxious because of social media and you have smartphones and you look at the correlation between when smartphones became widely used and when teenagers started becoming more depressed. And it's not as if that's false. Okay, track with me on this for a second. Maybe it is the smartphone that's contributing to the anxiety. But maybe it's not the singular cause of social media. Maybe it's a combination of factors. Maybe it's the access to information that's making you super stressed out. You know, maybe it's the lack of sleep that you're getting from being on your phone all night. Maybe it's the negativity that you see on Instagram, you know, as opposed to positivity that you would see in daily interactions. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's a combination of things. What makes a person a bully? What makes a person, I don't know, schizophrenic? There's all, it's a complex set of issues. So the downside to behaviorism is pretty simple. It doesn't fully appreciate the complexity of psychological issues. Right? So, even from, ironically, from the standpoint of Martin Seligman, we'll learn about his learned helplessness experiment that he did with dogs. And it, he was just showing that, like, you can condition dogs to give up hope. And we know that. You can condition horses to give up hope. In fact, you have to because they're such free spirited animals that you have to break the will of a horse to get it to allow you to, to mount them. Right? That's kind of sad and depressing. That makes a new appreciation. Horses don't make very good domestic animals, naturally. You have to psychologically break their will, right? That's kind of sad and depressing, right? The same thing is not necessarily true with dogs. Dogs are cooperative, they're collaborative, they're like genetically hardwired to exist in packs, right? So biology matters, cognition matters, psychology matters, right? When you go to therapy, some of you have therapists, some of you have been in therapy before, some of you are taking medications and you've seen all of this before and you know how it works. But here's the reality. There's some things that we have to consider when we look at the complexity of what makes you in the situation that you're in. Why are you sad? Why are you stressed? Why are you upset? Why are you so anxious? Why are you worried about the future? Why do you have self-esteem issues? Why do you? These are very complex issues, right? So let's start with some of the most basics when it comes to like goal setting and achievement orientation and things that happen in the future. Let's talk about this psychological concept right here. It's the motivation to perform a particular behavior, a desire, right? So if we use the academic example of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, it's pretty easy. If you're intrinsically motivated to 
read a textbook, I don't know why you would be, then you're going to get a lot out of that because you're seeking that, you're desiring that. That's something that you don't have to be incentivized in order to do. You have that internally in you, right? So you might be stressed out from school and go home and do something completely different. You might go for a run. You might paint or write or you might, I don't know, do whatever mindless thing that is you know, Freud would call subliminal, sublime, right? Whatever, whatever way you sublimate or cathartic experience that you do to ease your mind. You're intrinsically motivated to do that. So you might be intrinsically motivated to play an instrument. So because you're motivated to do it, you're going to become proficient in it, right? You're going to become proficient in it. It's this idea that if you're only externally motivated to do something, to participate in a behavior, the, then the desire to do that is only tied into the outcome. It's only tied into the reward. You're not going to become good enough at playing the guitar just because you're being rewarded for playing the guitar. Now, here's the thing. It's not as if you're always, it's not realistic to always be intrinsically motivated. You're not going to be intrinsically motivated to pay your taxes, but you have to, right? You're not going to be intrinsically motivated to go to work every day, but you have to, right? We talk about this in another class. Here's a great millennial fallacy for you. This is not something that parents used to tell their children. My generation was told this, and it's a fallacy. Get ready, right? This whole idea of like, well, do what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. That's complete crap. It's complete crap. Write it down just so you can cross it out. It's complete crap. In fact, I'm going to go a step further. If you want a good way to ruin your hobby, make it an obligation. You love fishing, so you become a professional fisherman. Way to take the one joy you have in your life and make it a responsibility. Congratulations. No, that's asinine, right? In fact, it also implies that what happens if, you're, if your work isn't mind-numbingly purposeful and fulfilling, then it's, it's not good work. It's not something that's worth doing. It can't be a fulfilling job. No, it's a very narcissistic millennial point of view, right? What work do I deserve? What, how should I grace the world with my attention? It's unbelievably short-sighted, right? Our grandparents worked in jobs that they were physically demanding, they probably didn't enjoy, and they did it at the same company for 40 years just so they would have the financial opportunity to sustain their families. That's the difference in mentality for two generations. No, just regular steady work is not good enough for us millennials. No, 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 no. We must do something earth-shattering. Right, I'll tell you a story about a former student I had who is not a millennial, Gen Z. This was a few years ago. and This student was on the verge. When I say this, I'm not exaggerating. On the actual verge of, a, of, of emotional collapse in front of my eyes. About to have a panic attack. I mean, visibly. Was shaking, had chest pain, shortness of breath. Right, Thought it was a hospital situation. It was at the end of the day one day they came back here to talk to me because they were worried that something medically was wrong with them. What's going on? What do I do? We get to the bottom of it. We can call a doctor. Whatever needs to happen can happen. And this, I, I'm talking to this student, and, and it became clear to me that the student was experiencing a panic attack. And w what they were suffering from was this very intense stress that they had over a global issue, right? So... I'll just pick one. Let's say it's like global poverty. That wasn't the issue. I think it was something environmental. But So this person has become overwhelmed by the thought of a global problem that they have no ability to even put a dent in. Right? So I want you to think about that. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that it isn't worth pursuing the world's problems. Right? If that's what you feel compelled to do, and that's what you're motivated to do, and then you're going to go to school and you're going to study solutions to this problem or bring a fresh perspective to it, certainly they could use your help. Join the fight. Fix the ozone layer. Fix the oceans. Clean up the garbage. Clean up the air quality. It's not like you can't help. Don't get me wrong. But think about how narcissistic this is. This person, and I don't say that as like an insult to them, but this is the mentality. This person was so overwhelmed emotionally by the stress of a global problem, right? Let's say it's global poverty. I'm just going to use that as an example. That they felt like, I have this plan for my life of what I want to do intrinsically, but I can't do that in good conscience because there's too many problems in the world that need to be solved. And I'm like, I get that. I understand conviction. Conviction is good. But you're not going to solve this problem. 
Sorry, you're not. By yourself, you're not going to solve this problem. In fact, you're thinking that you're going to be able to bring a fresh new perspective to something that billions and billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of experts have been working on for decades and are chipping away at. But see, that's, a, that's when we get into the coping strategies, emotion-centered coping versus problem-centered coping, that's an example of that. That's one example of how somebody's had so much access to information as, for all intents and purposes, a child, that they're carrying the weight of a global issue on their own individual shoulders. That was upsetting to me. Like, that's the actual world. It was upsetting to me to watch a child dissolve in front of my eyes about a world problem that they had no ability to solve. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be empathetic. It doesn't mean you shouldn't want to help. It doesn't mean you shouldn't want to be a part of the solution. Please don't misunderstand me. But that person was genuinely carrying the stress of what they were gonna do to solve the problem. Nothing, nothing. You'll spend your entire life and not put a dent in that. It doesn't mean it's not worthy to try, but they didn't need to have a panic attack about that in that moment, right? So let's get back to the fallacy. Where does that idea come from? It's a motivational conflict. Not in the Freudian sense, but in the literal sense. It's a conflict of, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do, but this is what I feel compelled to do. It's a generational fallacy. The fallacy that says, oh, well, you have to do something meaningful and earth-shattering, or your work has no meaning, and your life has no meaning. That's the reason why people are searching. They're searching to fill the void in their life with things that have nothing to do with their psychological problem. These are complex issues. The problem was a lack of control. We get into external locus of control in just a minute. That was the reason why this student was suffering a panic attack. It was the actual, perceived, complete lack of control. So the therapy, the cognitive behavioral therapy that would need to take place for that person to be in a good emotional place only works if someone is intrinsically motivated to solve the problem. Right? So if you're motivated to solve a problem and you go to therapy, here's what they do in cognitive behavioral therapy. See, this is where it's not behaviorism. It's the opposite of behaviorism. Because B.F. Skinner, remember, did not believe in free will. B.F. Skinner believed that every one of your behaviors was conditioned into you. And that's the way Watson was too. No, if you have a phobia, man, that's because you, you got conditioned to have a phobia. And Skinner believes if you're behaving in X, Y, or Z, that's because at some point that behavior was reinforced or something you tried to do was punished. And he never did it again. Skinner didn't believe in free will. He believed that everything was like some cosmic force pulling the strings. It was instincts, or it was uh, uh, past experiences, or it was desires, or it was homeostasis, or whatever. But he didn't believe that we had really free will choices. So the reality is, therapy works because it's about changing the mindset of a person. It's not about the behavior. It's not about the behavior. Well, if the behavior is you smoke, Timmy, let's go to therapy and learn how not to smoke. Because, quite honestly, that's how you use behaviorism to solve a problem, right? So if you, if you have a drinking problem, right, and what they'll do is they'll take some, like, chemical, and they'll say, okay, you can participate in this study, and we'll put this chemical in your alcohol. So whenever you go to reach for the whiskey bottle, you'll drink some, and you'll become violently ill. And the hope is, is that you associate the sickness, right, classical conditioning, with the alcohol and you'll stop reaching for the alcohol because you're worried it's gonna make you sick. But the one thing they don't think about in that scenario is cognition. A functional adult, let me say it cognitively functional. If they're an addict, they may not be very functional on a day-to-day -day basis, but, but a cognitively developed adult understands full well in a moment of weakness when they're having a desire, an addiction desire for alcohol, that it's not the whiskey that's making me sick. It's the chemical that they place in the whiskey to make me sick. So they know in a moment of weakness, if I can just get my hands on some untainted whiskey, I'm not going to have the same outcome. So cognition is the limit to behaviorism. That's the first thing you have to understand. Behaviorism stops at human ability to make decisions. The ventromedial prefrontal cortex, it's a lot of syllables, right? The prefrontal cortex is your ability to make decisions, what Freud called the ego. It's not that you stop having desires when you become fully developed. 
No, it's that you decide to make a different choice. So cognitive behavioral therapy is not eliminating the desire for something. It's about teaching you coping mechanisms so that you're able to overrule your emotion with a logical choice, right? So to make, take it full circle, back to your desire, what do I study? I'm intrinsically motivated by literature. And so you take an AP literature class instead of taking a, you know, a English three class or whatever, right? You might be extrinsically motivated in your job, right? You go to work. Now, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Jobs can be more or less fulfilling. They can be more or less purposeful. In fact, you've heard me say you can't get paid enough money to have a job that you hate, and that's true. So it's a, it's a false statement to say I get no intrinsic value out of doing this for a living, right? I am intrinsically motivated to be here and working because I enjoy my job, but... That's given a choice of this job compared to another job. See the difference there? If I had a choice of being here at work or not being here at work, hmm, which one am I gonna choose? So it really doesn't matter what intrinsically drives you. When you make it an obligation, it becomes that. It becomes a responsibility. Even if you're a professional athlete, it's now a job. It's now a chore. It's now a responsibility. It's something that has extrinsic behavioral consequences to it. So that's the key here for academia, right? You may only be extrinsically motivated to read the chapter, to fill out your answers, or to turn in your study guide, or to do your homework in math, or whatever the case may be. That's an external reward, and that's fine. But the point is, you don't have to make yourself be intrinsically motivated, but it's just the simple study that if you're intrinsically motivated, you're gonna get a lot more, lot more out of something, we'll say, right? So let's say, for instance, you become suspicious of your significant other. I wonder if they're cheating on me. Well, you're really motivated to find the answer to that problem, aren't you? You become a real detective, right? If that's something that you just desire to know, it's going to be a lot more, you're going to be a lot more in depth with it. It's just like, it, like if you enjoy playing an instrument, it becomes a 10,000 hour rule. You become really proficient at it. So maybe in that side, that's a good way to look at it from your job. Maybe we can amend the millennial fallacy. Right? It's not that it's not going to be a job. You're going to enjoy every single day of work. No, Monday is still Monday after the weekend, even if you fish for a living. But there are some intrinsic motivating factors inside of your job while you have to be there that are going to be a benefit to you rather than just going to work, punching the clock, getting a paycheck, and moving on with your life. Yes? What if you had an intrinsic motivation, but you didn't have, but you had extrinsic outcomes, right. but you didn't have to do it on like, So give, so give me an example. You mean like in a job? Like if you like painting or something, okay. you can paint whenever you want, and then you can sell your painting That's, whenever you want. That I like. Money, that I like. And here's why. So there's, there, there's a limit to that, though. So what happens if I take something that I'm intrinsically motivated to do and tie it in with an extrinsic reward? Right? So let's say, for instance, like you really enjoy just like creating media content, and you create a YouTube channel, and you start getting famous and you get more subscribers and then you reach that you know 4,000 mark and then you you know you of hours and you start getting ads and money and you're like okay there's something to this so at what point this is a rhetorical question at what point does your intrinsic to desire to do something on your schedule turn into an obligation right there lies the issue so let's say you're painting as a side hustle you have your job you go to your job because you have to because you need money to pay your bills blah <laughs> So you go to work every day, you hate your job, you want to come home and you want to paint because it makes you happy, or you want to write. Okay, you go into journalism because you like writing. You know what writers don't like? Deadlines. You enjoy the process of writing, but there's still a requirement there. There's still a responsibility there, right? So that's a good scenario. What happens if I do something that I enjoy on the side as a side hustle, and I'm fortunate enough that it turns into a money-making career. Well, at some point, the intrinsic desire to do that thing becomes completely tied into the extrinsic responsibility of having to do it. And then you get what's called the over-justification effect. Okay? Write down the over-justification effect because that's a good point. At what point does my fun-loving hobby that I can do on my own schedule 
turn into a responsibility. And the reason why I'm telling you all this, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm trying to destroy that fallacy where you're gonna walk away from something that's perfectly legitimate and fulfilling because you're chasing some Disney dream bubble that's floating above your head like, well, what about that perfect job? It doesn't exist. The perfect job is called a hobby, right? That's what it's called. Because as she suggested, why? What's the difference between a hobby and a job? Even if it's the same activity, it's the responsibility that's around it. I have to be there at a certain time. I have to stay for a certain time. I have a quota of things that I have to create and produce. I'm backed up against deadlines, which means you can't really do it at your own leisure on your own schedule. Yes, is it more enjoyable to write for a living than to do something else? Maybe, but it still has extrinsic motivating factors to it. So what begins as an intrinsic motivator might eventually become the over justification effect and turn into an extrinsic motivation. So let's, let's look at that. I mean, we beat this to death with your, your, you know, your academic motivators. Like, why do you take a class? Okay, well, you might like chemistry better than you like, you know, I don't know, something else, zoology. And so you take chemistry honors instead of taking zoology or oceanography or whatever. So you had a choice there, but it's still an extrinsic motivator, right? Would you go to class if you didn't have to? Would you read the book if you didn't have to? Some people would. Some people are really into marine biology, and they study it because it fascinates them. So there's something that intrinsically drives you, right? And those are the things that you pour yourself into, right? That's the motivation, right? But let's look at this, okay? How does the cognitive perspective show us the limits, the limits of your training, the limits of your rewards, right? So for instance, let's get into the overjustification effect. And these are like token economies where you're like giving kids rewards for doing stuff. Like, oh, hey, you got all A's, you read all your books, I'm going to give you, you know, you got straight A's, I'm going to give you $50 for each A. Well, the kid very quickly is going to stop being intrinsically motivated to learn material, and they're only going to do it if that motivator is there, right? What happens if you do write? And you start getting paid as a freelance journalist, and you write an article and you sell it to a magazine, or you write an article and you sell it to a newspaper, or you write a story and it gets published well then you're only gonna desire to write for the purpose of selling that because now that's become a money-making ability right so promising people a reward for a task they already enjoy can backfire so yeah we may have to reward you to get you to come to school and to go to math class but we don't have to reward you to play the piano if that's something you love doing right so if we take something that's intrinsic like fishing turn it into a job it's gonna lose its intrinsic value, right? So in other words, like, it's, you're never gonna like psychologically mistake your Monday shift at work for fun. I thought I was on vacation for a second. No, welcome to adulthood, go to work, okay? You have this, you have this like delayed adulthood, emerging adulthood, right? Arrested development is what it's called. It's this, you're clinging on to childhood and immaturity. It's like, well, what if I don't go to college? What if I just back, backpack through Europe for a year so I can find myself? All right, well, what happens if I just decide to live in a tiny house in the woods and I don't have that many expenses and people will leave me alone? And you're like, it's a free country and it's my life. Well, yeah, kinda. Because like, what if everybody had that mentality? Right, it's really a, a lack of being responsible is what it is. And you say, well, why is it anyone else's business? Well, it's not, but it's, 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 like, the great, it's like the great communism fallacy, right? It's this idea that like, yeah, this works. Communism works in little tiny pockets inside of a capitalistic society. Your tiny house dream and traveling the country in an RV works inside of a capitalistic society where everybody else is going to work. It doesn't work if there's no economy. It doesn't work if there's no infrastructure. It doesn't work if there's no medical field. It doesn't work. So unless enough people are keeping the system afloat, you don't get to be in a tiny house and live off the grid and not vote or pay taxes. It's irresponsible. And it seems like freedom, the American dream. It's millennial irresponsibility is what it is, right? It's a lack of being accountable to the system. Working age people that could be solving the world's problems. Right? Here's the reason why I'm telling you this. It's not like a rant. The reason why I'm telling you this is because I don't want you to fall victim to the ideology that you're going to have some emotional epiphany about what it is that you should do for a living. Like you'll be sleeping and then all of a sudden like 
the, the, the ceiling will part and some like giant light beam will come in and be like, be a nurse. <gasps> the universe spoke to me. I should be a nurse. Being a nurse is stressful as hell, right? It's probably really fulfilling. So you can have a fulfilling job that you're intrinsically stimulated by sometimes, but you still have responsibility. You still have responsibility. And that's the downside to rewarding everyone all the time. Right? If you guys have ever heard the complaint about that everyone gets a trophy generation, really what they mean, and they don't really understand this because they're like Twitter philosophers, it's the over-justification effect. Like what happens if you take little kids who just love playing baseball or soccer, softball, basketball, it doesn't matter what it is, and you take something that's a fun game that they enjoy playing recreationally with their friends, and you make it this rewarded thing. Well, you play baseball and you get this trophy right here. Well, the trophy has now lost all value. It's just become a token for participating in a behavior. Now, is it that bad? No. I mean, it's not necessarily a horribly psychologically harmful thing to give a kid a trophy. But what are you doing? You're rewarding them for something that they would have done anyway. That's the point. That's what the overjustification effect is. You're rewarding someone for something they would have done anyway. But now you broke it. Now you tied it into the reward. Now that's where this millennial buzzword entitlement comes from. Well, aren't I supposed to be in National Honor Society? Well, yes, 100% of your grade is in the National Honor Society. Now it has no honor because it's just everybody. Well, can't they just make an exception? 101? Can't we just have two valedictorians? Because don't we both deserve it? No, you deserve nothing. Don't I deserve to be happy, coach? Absolutely not. We're all horrible people, you and I both. We're self-centered, we're self-serving, we don't deserve anything. It's not about what you deserve and what you get and what you don't. That's why my generation of people is overwhelmingly unhappy. They were sold a bill of goods, ladies and gentlemen. They were lied to. The complaint is legitimate. They say, well, I did everything I was supposed to do. I went to college and I got this degree and I got this piece of paper on the wall and now I can't pay my bills and I live with my parents and I'm 30. The system must be broken. This is the highest instance of self-identified socialists in that 18 to 34 bracket in the history of America, including when socialism was a viable political party. Well, why? because they believe the system is broken. They just suck at it. But they were sold a bill of goods. Now let's pick it apart. Why? Some people in my generation were very successful and some people were not. That doesn't work as a system flaw. Anytime you complain about the system and you say, well, uh, the system is racist. Well, okay. What's racist about it? Well, the, the tests are Eurocentric. Okay, what about the Asians? Well, they don't count. Racism. It's, it's, it doesn't work. What about the non-white people that do well on the test? Outliers. <laughs> it's not a systemic problem. It's a fallacy. It's a bill of goods that was sold. It's a, it's a generation of people that have been clouded to the truth of actual work ethic. Right? So here's the reality. Let me pick it apart for you because luckily you guys are not millennials. When millennials say, I did my part, I got a degree. Well, yes. Instead of getting your 120 hour bachelor's degree in the four years it was supposed to have taken you, you were in school like it was your job for seven years. So you took seven years to get a four year degree. So in which case, delaying your entry into making money and also accruing more cost. So instead of paying $30,000 for that degree, which is what it was worth, you paid $80,000 for that degree. <laughs> Congratulations, you found a way to pay more money for something. It's like somebody trying to sell you the shoes. Hey, uh, you can buy these shoes, they're $200. How about if I give you 350 and only take one of them? Sold. That's stupid math. That's bad math. It's a whole generation of college students with bad math. So they go to college and they stay there for like a decade, right? Like they're on a personal path to discovery and they come out at 28 years old with a degree that's 
120 hours, they have $80,000 in debt, now they're entry-level employees at 28, and they go, well, I could have been a doctor by now. I could have been a lawyer. Yeah, bro, you could have. But instead, you spent the last seven years studying anthropology or whatever it is that you study. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's not, a, it's not the pathway. And that's why you live with your parents, you have so much debt. You did it wrong, dude, you did it wrong, right? It's the over-justification effect. It's an entire generation of people who have been incentivized for things that they would have just intrinsically done anyway. You don't have to incentivize kids to read. You don't have to incentivize kids to play sports. You don't have to do it. It doesn't hurt their psyche to not get trophies because they chose to play the sport. They would do it anyway. They do it for free in the yard. But instead, we've trained that behavior out of them. It's the over-justification effect. It's only about the external reward. In other words, millennials were the first generation of people in school who started asking, uh, Mr. Teacher Man, why do I need to know this? How does this affect me? My life is so important that I need to know the specific relevance of this fact that you're teaching me in chemistry and exactly when I'll use this and how. And they taught you that, and now you do it. Well, how self-serving is that? It's actually comical, right? And then you're like, Coach, this is mean. You're being mean. No, I'm pointing out the, the cultural problems that have turned into economic problems. They have. It's a complex issue. We blame the economy. We blame the school system. We blame anything else we can blame. Why? Because we don't really think we can change our situation. It's a locus of control problem, right? So again, examples of intrinsic motivation being destroyed by rewards. In experiments, children have been promised a payoff for playing with an in interesting puzzle or toy. Later, they played with the toy less than the children who were paid for playing with the same toy. Likewise, rewarding children with toys or candy for reading diminishes the time that they actually spend reading. In other words, they only do it to complete the task at hand because now it has an outcome tied to it, which is back to the question about my job. What happens if I enjoy painting or I enjoy creating media content and now I can turn this into a source of income? I'm not saying you shouldn't, but you should be cognizant of the fact that it's going to lose its intrinsic joy because now you're turning it into a responsibility, right? You're turning it into a responsibility. And we talked about the biopsychosocial approaches, like there are biological things about you, there are cultural things about you, environmental things about you, psychological, all these issues are complex, right? So let's get into coping. This is gonna be a little closer to home. I'm gonna stop yelling at you. I, mean, I wasn't really yelling at you because you're not millennials anyway, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna appeal to some of the things that you might be experiencing, which are really actually pretty difficult. Anxiety triggers and depression triggers and what is our society to do about this growing psychological concern? The numbers are astounding, right? You have people having panic attacks, a higher incidence of teenagers on anti-anxiety medications than ever before in history. Adderall prescriptions are up in elementary school age kids for the most they've ever been in history. Just in the last eight months, six months or so, the suicide rate has gone up more, it's more than tripled since March. Now, it's not all from COVID shutdowns. It's also political turmoil and, you know, social injustice movements and school closings and lack of job prospects and financial struggles. And there's all kinds of contributing factors. It's clearly an issue. So much so that it's now a state mandate that you sit through eight different sessions of mental health training, right? It's clearly an issue. So how is an entire generation who suffers from the same problems supposed to move forward? Well, I want you to understand this very clearly. The solution to anxiety disorders is not eliminating stress. That's important because a lot of people think that it is. A lot of people believe that, well, if my child or significant other or whatever, fill in the blank, as a stress disorder, let me try to alleviate the stressor. That's a good approach in the short term, but it doesn't actually solve the heart of the problem. Back to the addiction problem, if we go with taste aversion and alcohol, or if we go through actual behavioral therapy, like, okay, so you have a phobia, we can probably condition that out of you, but if you're an addict, 
we can't condition that out of you necessarily with therapy, right? Because the reality is, is that it's a complex issue. So if we don't attack the cognition behind the behavior and only address the behavior, it's an issue. Just the same reason why punishment doesn't really work that well for kids. Like, they punish you to get you to stop participating in behaviors, so it's really not that effective because you still have the cognitive motivator behind the behavior, right? So your parents can, like, discipline you into staying at home and not doing dangerous things or, you know, they can control your life with behavior modification, but it doesn't do anything to affect your thought processes, your mind, your emotional wants and desires, a fragile emotional state that you're in. So let me, let me give you an example that pertains to anxiety. We'll talk about anxiety and coping first, and then we'll talk about learned helplessness and depression second. There's two different ways that you can cope with a stressor. Let's call it a stressor. The stressor is the trigger, right? The button that gets pushed, right? So if you, if you have socialized anxiety that's tied to a school setting, let's unpack that. What are you really stressed about? It's not the building. It's like this weird shade of beige just gives me stress. I don't like it. Paint the walls. The shape of the building is really aggressive. It's a microaggression. I don't like it. It's the sound in the hallways that it's, it's not the acoustics. Right? Those are all ridiculously asinine to even suggest. No. What it is that you're stressed about is the things that go on inside the building. If we want to eliminate your anxiety from being at school, we don't remove you from school. Mom, let me look at the camera when I say that. Karen, that's not, now look, I mean, that's every parent, is, it's their decision. But, but my, my point to you is when you look at the long-term research, and there's multitudes of data to back this up, eliminating stress triggers as a way to combat anxiety not only does not work long-term, it actually diminishes your coping abilities. Right? And so people say, well, two generations ago, people had a lot more problems. And your first response is, well, they just didn't understand anxiety. And actually, no, there's some logic to this. They had to deal with their problems. They just had to. They had to cope or they gave up. I mean, it happens. There were no safety nets for them to not deal with the reality of their problems. They couldn't go to a psychiatrist and get a prescription for Xanax and then just not deal with it. They had to. It was a part of their culture. That's why they were a more resilient generation. I'm not saying they're a better generation because I think the world is a better place now, right? But they were more resilient. I'll give them that. They were more resilient two generations ago because the world was just a more difficult place to live in back then, right? The harsh realities of life were more harsh than they are now. So there's two ways to do this. And if you're not careful, you can, you can learn the wrong one, right? If you went to therapy or if you're just dealing with a problem on your, on your own. So insert problem, fill in the blank, doesn't matter what it is. Problem-focused coping is to attempt to alleviate stress directly by changing the stressor or the way that we interact with that stressor, right? That's what we want. Emotion-focused coping is attempting to alleviate the stress by avoiding or ignoring a stressor and attending to emotional needs rather than our stress reactor. And there's some logic to that. There's some logic to that. Instead of like downplaying your emotions, oh, I shouldn't be afraid about this, what's wrong with me? Well, no, you kind of lean into that and evaluate your emotions. You feel the way you feel, right? That's important for you to hear. In any given situation, you don't apologize for your emotions because you can't control them. You feel the way you feel. It's not your job and your responsibility to fix your emotions, but you do have to learn to deal with your emotions, right? But let's jump into it, right? The problem-centered approach has to do with how much of your situation you feel like you can alleviate, right? This idea of personal control. If we go back to it, right? Attempting to alleviate stress directly by changing the stressor or the way we interact with the stressor, right? So maybe it is okay. Go back to the Karen example. Maybe her, her son is being viciously bullied at school and he's 12 years old and it's affecting his self-esteem. He's developed an eating disorder and maybe he has psychological trauma. It might be better just to get him out of that environment until he can get in a situation where he's well again, right? So it is fair to say that sometimes you have to remove the stress environment. 
But think about what happens, say, when you're in combat. Right? You can't just say, well, soldiers signed up for that. They knew what they were getting into. Well, no, that doesn't change anything about the psychological problems that they experience. Right? In other words, just coming to grips with the reality of your problem doesn't do enough to make this problem go away. There's not always solutions. This is a downside. I'll, 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 I'll wear this one. Like, this is the problem that most males have when they have, when they have an emotional problem, even as an, as an adult. It's not that they have more or less problems than women do. It's that they're less in touch with their emotional responses. So men tend to think that their emotions are irrational. That's what they think, right? I'm afraid right now. Well, that's just, I'm being soft. Well, no, you, you feel the way you feel. You don't apologize for your feelings, right? I'll teach you something that maybe you don't know. Every one of your senses, right, goes through the thalamus of the brain, and that's how it gets converted, and it's called transduction. But the next step in the process is this little tiny bean in both of your hemispheres in the limbic system called the amygdala. And the amygdala is responsible for fear, aggression, rage. So why? Whenever you see something, hear something, smell something, which could be a taste, for the first time ever, your brain has to evaluate whether or not it's a threat to you. So having a fear response is actually way more natural than you think. Right? You're walking through the woods and something moves and you're like, <gasps> attack, threat, alert. Eh, eh, eh. It's way safer. It's way safer. But then you cognitively evaluate. Right? Cognitively, but you want to drive a wedge between the trigger and then the emotional response, right? So for instance, let's say I, I heard this explained one time by, by, by a psychotherapist. What if you think about stress this way? What if the stress is actually your body's way of preparing you for a very important task that you need to focus on, right? That's the purpose of cortisol, right? That's the purpose of stress. So this is kind of a weird example. So I'm sorry to use this weird example. It's kind of emotionally triggering, but let's say you're sitting inside your house, your parents are out to dinner, it's like 10 or 11 p.m., you're just chilling, watching Netflix, and then you turn around and you walk to go to the kitchen to get something to eat, and you see a person standing in your front lawn through the window. Immediately, alarms and alerts are going off in your brain, the amygdala is triggered, all of a sudden, it's a fear response, well, what is this person going to do? Are they here to harm me? Are they here to attack me? It's your cognitive processes are going, this is way past delivery time, it's dark, what's going to happen? And here's what you do because you're a sane animal. You go and hide under the couch and call everyone you know. It's not a successful strategy. The reality is, what if that stress response of your fear is preparing you for the possibility that you may have to defend yourself? Well, you don't want to think about that. What if that fear response is to heighten your senses to get you prepared for something that will actually keep you alive? Hiding from a threat is not going to keep you alive. Unless you hide really, really well. Eventually, let's assume that that person is motivated to find you. I mean, again, I know that's like a horrifying example, but it's a good, it's a good emotionally triggering example because the fear is adaptive. It's to help you survive. But what is the purpose? It's not to shut you down and make you shrink somewhere and die a very miserable, afraid death. No, quite the opposite. It's to alert you to the reality of the danger that you find yourself in. Same thing on your tests. What if it's not a person standing on your lawn? What if it's like the Unit 6 test? <gasps> I forgot we had this. What if your fear response is preparing you for a potentially threatening behavior or, or situation, we'll say, that you need to be locked into? Look at your stress as something that helps you, not something that harms you. Because if you're too apathetic to a threat, you may actually die. Right? If you nonchalantly walk along the, like, you know, railing of a high-rise balcony, whoa, you fall to your death. That's why that happens when people are drunk. Well, what happens when you get intoxicated? All those logical centers of properly understanding the fear of things that could kill you, they just go away. So you're like, I wonder if I will die. Too late. No restarts. Life isn't a video game. Fear is an important part of keeping you alive because it gives you a healthy emotional response to something that might possibly kill you. But use that to your advantage. The test is not going to kill you, but if you treat it like it will, you're going to have a panic attack instead of thinking clearly. Right? It's all in how you deal with the stressor. Notice I didn't say lose your test anxiety. I said use your test anxiety. Hmm? 
Mm -hmm. You don't want fear to control you. Panic disorder is not very helpful, right? Two rats receive simultaneous shocks. One can turn, on, turn the wheel and stop the shock. The helpless rat, but not the wheel turner, becomes more susceptible to ulcers and lower immunity to disease. As you see this in frontline health workers all the time also. High stress positions, Department of Corrections, police officers, teachers, and humans too, uncontrollable threats trigger the strongest stress responses. Uncontrollable, a lack of control, right? What is learned helplessness? This is gonna be like our transition into the next conversation we're going to have. Let me move ahead to go back. You have to understand something very biological about how your body perceives stress. And this is like the shelf that we'll put the, we'll hang it on so when we come back it'll make sense. Your brain has many pathways and this feedback loop from the brain to the body, like the organs that secrete hormones. One that you should probably pay close attention to, and this is in the Rockstar Manifesto also, is known as the HPA axis. The HPA axis, axis in a literal term. It has, like, you know, a connection to it. This is what's known as the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And if you look at what all those things do, your hypothalamus, homeostasis, pituitary gland, that's what puts the chemicals into your bloodstream. The adrenal gland, that's adrenaline. So this is how the hypothalamus communicates with the pituitary gland to communicate with your adrenal glands. This is your stress pathway in the brain. The stress pathway in the brain is called the HPA axis, right? So hypothalamus to the anterior, anterior of the pituitary gland, which puts a stress hormone into the bloodstream, which interacts with the adrenal cortex when it gets there, and cortisol becomes abundant in the body. This is the connection between your brain and your bloodstream for fight or flight. And when they do studies on students who suffer from panic disorders and anxiety disorders, they have way, way, way more active HPA pathways. So can we turn that off? No. We have to learn how to prevent a stress emotion from becoming like a drastically overwhelming panic or dread, right? So it's not that we're eliminating the stress, it's that we're eliminating the panic response to the stress when it comes up. And that is the key, ladies and gentlemen, to fighting anxiety on a daily basis. So that's where we're gonna get to, or come from tomorrow. We're gonna look at how people give up hope. Too much stress in their life turns into learned helplessness and they just literally stop believing they have control over their situation. And they do nothing to make themselves Better. So that's where we'll pick up tomorrow with learned helplessness and stress responses in the body.